Uh, (laughs) All right, listen, I think the most interesting thing going on in our industry this week is Elizabeth Holmes' trial has begun. Um, Jury selection uh, started this week, and it's going to cover 12 counts of fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud over false claims she made about the blood test results from Theranos. Um, They uh, have now selected a jury of 12 Northern California residents consisting of seven men and five women. It took two days to question around 100 potential jurors about their answers to a 28-page questionnaire uh, that included news outlets they read, uh, what news out- outlets they read, if they knew any witnesses, and if they had any negative medical experiencing uh, experiences. And um, it was complicated um, to get these because it- it's impossible to not know about it. And um, now it seems the uh, interesting thing is Elizabeth Holmes, uh, who worked on this company for two dec- close to two decades and was involved in this fraud from start to finish, is now uh, taking the position that she uh, was under the control of her business partner, Sonny Balwani, uh, and that he uh, had been abusing her and uh, controlling her. Uh, what are your thoughts on and so he's being tried separately, by the way. They're going to be tried in sequential order. So whenever this trial ends, then he gets to um, get tried. What are your thoughts on uh, if she will be convicted and her defense strategy? I, I think this is more. This is like less about the specific um, evidence against her as much as it's, um, and, and it's much more right now about the um, whole Silicon Valley fake it before you make it. Um, approach to entrepreneurship. And, you know, we all hear this from, um, you know, all the entrepreneurial kind of advisors and, you know, experience, stories of experience and stories of success that in order to kind of achieve success as an entrepreneur, you really have to oversell and promise and create an incredible narrative about where your business is headed. And in many cases, that gets a- ahead of you. Now, the public, the general public that doesn't operate within Silicon Valley with as much breadth as we do, I think, they hear the stories of the Adam Newmans and WeWork and the collapse and Elizabeth Holmes and this this Trevor Milton guy and and Nicola, but um, there's thousands of these other sorts of smaller stories where a VC rolls his eyes, where the first board meeting after raising money is like, wait a second, we're actually going to be half our forecast when we raise money, or the numbers are going to be way below, or the product doesn't actually work as we presented it to Sorry, you. Sorry, I, I don't think meetings. I've ever funded a company where that hasn't been the case. Exactly, and so I think that's the that's the the the, the big question, right? Shamat is like. Does this trail, does this trial kind of indict the way Silicon Valley operates and the storytelling models and the narrative models? There are examples of these people getting a little too far ahead of their skis. And maybe you can argue they could perceive something to be non fraudulent while other people can, you know, kind of perceive it to be fraudulent. But don't we see this kind of broadly in Silicon Valley? And doesn't this kind of bring up a question on like, are all startups now and is the industry going to have a shift as a result of this trial? in terms of behavior as investors and as entrepreneurs and how you tell stories, how you diligence, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is only going to get meaningfully worse. Um, I don't know if Elizabeth Holmes committed fraud or not. I think that you know these folks will be able to um, figure that out in detail. But here's something that I do know pretty precisely, which is the amount of money that's trying to get into Silicon Valley is going exponentially up. Yeah. And as that happens, you guys now see it every day where there are firms whose entire business now is just to literally write a check every day. They're closing deals every single day. They're doing zero diligence. And so what that's going to create is an incentive for founders, particularly those whose backs are against the wall or who's doing something that's highly speculative and hard to diligence to stretch the truth to get the capital. And it's impossible for guys like us to actually step in and do diligence on a lot of these companies, even if you actually have time. But then if the competitive dynamic is such that you don't even have the time because somebody else beside you is going to rip in a check with, by just meeting somebody um, and, you know, quote unquote, having done the work on their own, which is impossible because they're not, you, you don't have access to somebody's, you know, financial books, this problem is only going to get worse. And so I think we as an industry just have to realize that there's going to be an incentive to lie. There's going to be an incentive to stretch the truth. And it's because of the amount of money that's available and the lack of diligence that's happening. Sachs, is this an example uh, in the case of Elizabeth Holmes of somebody being delusional as a strength 
or somebody committing fraud as a crime? It's probably both. Now, look, I think you guys are giving a little bit too much credence to the media narrative that Theranos is a quote unquote Silicon Valley failure. The truth of the matter is there was no major Silicon Valley VC firm, in fact, not even a minor one, that invested in Theranos, as far as I know. There was no VC on the board of Theranos. We've talked about this before. It was a bunch right. of kind of grand poobah types. And there was no one who actually had the technical competence to do diligence. And so Elizabeth Holmes isn't so much an example of Silicon Valley as somebody who was selling Silicon Valley. She was selling the promise of Silicon Valley. She was selling the idea that this was going to be a decacorn or a centicorn yeah. to people who are too unwitting to know. And I see, you know, Tim Draper, a lot people are really hanging their hat on t- the fact that Tim Draper wrote a seed investment to Elizabeth Holmes. I, you know, that, that really is very different. You know, when you write a seed investment, apparently Elizabeth Holmes was like a neighbor of his. She clearly, yeah, their daughters were friends is my understanding. Yeah, and she clearly was an impressive person. You know, she came across impressively in person. She obviously cast a pretty big reality distortion field to a lot of, you know, smart people. So, you know, she's the type of person who you would write potentially a C check to just based on, you know, a talent bet. The fact that she that later chose to engage in, in fraud, I don't think that's like Tim Draper's fault. And it doesn't make this like a Silicon Valley fraud. Again, um, you know, show us the VC firm that was hoodwinked by this. Um, but you are seeing, David, this trend of the, the firms coming in and not doing diligence, not having audit rights, not having information rights, not doing proper diligence, and basically yes. relying on the previous investors. Right. How troubling is that? And what are you doing to protect Kraft's LPs? Yeah. So, so look, I think there's a big difference between going into uh, a board meeting and finding out the projections were inflated because, like, frankly, we all take projections with a grain of salt, right? But versus the founder lying about the past, right? So people are always going to put the rosiest picture or they're going to puff up what the future is going to look like. And it's up to you as the investor to determine if that's true or not. But they cannot lie about the past. They cannot lie about what their revenue was last year, what contracts they signed before you invested. That is fraud, right? And that is what, that's where Elizabeth Holmes crossed the line. She wasn't just painting a rosy picture of, you know, what the technology would look like, you know, years from now. She was lying about their capabilities at the time people were investing. That is the line you cannot cross. Um, look, we conduct diligence. We, you know, try to look at we, financials. We try to make sure that the numbers are all true. Um, you know, frankly, we're not investing in things that involve a tremendous amount of technical risk, a lot of technology risk. So we always use the product before we invest. The idea that the product would be faked, I think it would be hard to perpetrate that kind of fraud with a SaaS company. But um, so look, I mean, th- well, that's what we look at. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I just mm-hmm. dropped a link into the uh, Zoom chat. Co-founder and former CEO of Palo Alto-based startup technology company Headspin, charged with securities fraud and wire fraud. And uh, this guy, Lakwani, 45 from Santa Clara County, basically was lying about their ARR in a SaaS company. And this is, this is, they this raised is a bunch of money. So th- right. this is an example of it somebody- It can happen in every company. Yeah, it can happen at- yeah, yeah. SaaS, I, think that, I don't yeah. think you're inoculated just because you invest in SaaS. My point is, if you have a person that's willing to rip in a check, $100 million, three hours after meeting you, asking for no diligence- at some point, David, your back is going to be against the wall because you're going to have to justify to your LPs why you aren't in some of these theoretically good deals, right? Mm. And some of them will become fraudulent. They'll just turn out to yeah. be. It's just the laws of distribution. So it's a bit of a prisoner's dilemma, you're saying, Shamath. I mean, well, I, you I don't do, how do you, you have to get deals done you're, look, no, and no, you're no, up you're, against you're, people who won't do diligence. No, no, it actually comes down to something different, which is then you have to differentiate with real brand, meaning- mm. If somebody really wants you on the cap table, they will absolutely slow everything down to get you. Correct. Right? So for example, like let's let's assume like it's Mike Moritz, I'll use that. There is nobody in the world, I think, who's not a complete buffoon moron who wouldn't slow his process or her process down to get Mike to be on their board. Mm-hmm. And so if you're willing to basically just scuttle an entire process um, and just take the fastest money... I think it actually says something that there is more risk in backing somebody like you than somebody that wouldn't slow down. So, or right. So then, you know, the problem is there's fewer, there's fewer and fewer Mike Morris's in the world. You know, 
I think Sachs is one of those people. I think Peter Thiel is another kind of person. You know, Bill Gurley is another kind of person. So there are these people in our industry where I think that you will um, slow things down. And I do think allow these folks to do diligence. And I think there will be less fraud in general for that cohort. But if your platform becomes one that's just about ripping money in, and I think the late stages are roughly this, they're all it's all brand independent because the this money is, is the same, the valuations right. are the same. But does, does Freeberg, Freeberg. Yeah, Freeberg. I mean, doesn't it introduce the risk? of the retail investor, you know, we're seeing more retail participation via syndicates, um, you know, via, um, you know, one-off investments, online kind of marketplaces, and also SPACs, where the retail investor relies on, you know, Chamath, some of these kind of bigger institutional or perhaps some name that gets some carried interest in an investment doing the diligence. And if the activity level is going up and the dollars are flowing in, and the margin of error is increasing, you know, is there not some inevitable kind of SEC backlash and consideration around how are private companies ultimately raising money um, and how much they yeah, are well, disclosing? And we kind of face this, you know, I can, uh, yeah. regulatory I, I, threat. I, yeah. I, again, address this as a syndicate lead. You know, we only take accredited investor money at this time. And so well, anything that happens is with obviously sophisticated people, the top 4% of Americans investing in companies. And in our diligence now, we have seen a spike in what I'll call um, <clears throat> uh, massaging uh, uh, or painting the picture in a way that I'm not comfortable with. And we have maybe tripled the amount of time we're putting into diligence now because I really care about my reputation. And maybe 20, 30% of the companies we wind up after initially wanting to invest, maybe giving them an offer, getting an allocation. Um, in recent history, 20, 30%, we're winding up backing out during the diligence process because. Uh, their revenue was not software based. There was a hundred thousand in consulting revenue. For me, it's like if you're going to, you know, make these kind of decisions early on in the company, I think it's indicative of future fraud or future um, moral or ethical issues. So we're we're sitting out uh, in a lot of cases. There are uh, public platforms now, Republic and Seed Invest, which I know are also increasing their um, diligence process because there's so many newcomers to the space. And I think there's a level I'll be quite frank here, of entitlement amongst founders that is being, um, let's say, uh, encouraged uh, in, unintentionally by the lack of diligence that's going on. People are not taking the process as seriously as they did 10 years ago or even five years ago. Well, let me, yeah, look, I, I, I agree. I think the, the diligence you're doing is really good. And, um, and here's where I agree with, with Chamath. Um, so we have seen this trend in our industry of the private equity money coming in in greater volumes, in greater, you know, earlier and earlier and faster and faster, right? And it started with, you know, you have these, um, like, frankly, like public company investors were looking at the, uh, I, the value at IPO relative to the last private round. And they saw, wow, there's like two, three X market here for one year. Those are phenomenal returns. Let's arb that by getting into the last private round. Then they look at the second to last private round. They're like, well, wait, there's a big return there. So they keep moving earlier and earlier to R about that return. But to Tomas' point, it's just they're applying a financial model where they're not in the diligence business. They're just, um, and, and, and I think they just see like fraud as a cost of doing business, right? Something they can That's exactly model right. out with the portfolio. But, oh. but the only reason they can model it out that way and have the fraud be an acceptable and predictable sort of cost of doing business is because you had these firms in our industry who actually did diligence at the seed, at the Series A, right? Yes. And now, and now the private yes. equity guys, they're moving so early, they're actually even now doing the, they're, they're moving all the way to Series A. So no one's doing the diligence. And so, so, so that, is, that is a risk, I think, because it might actually change things. And this is where, bringing it back to Elizabeth Holmes, um, I think it's important here that there's a conviction. I think she should do time. This was clearly a, a major big fraud, big time fraud. And even if she didn't directly perpetrate it on Silicon Valley VCs, I think the message to the industry would be absolutely horrible if she gets away with it. And frankly, I'm a little concerned she's going to get away with it, um, you know, because well, she uh, is incredibly charismatic. John Kerry was saying on a CNBC hit that she, don't underestimate her charisma and ability to snow people and the Shvengali defense. And she just had a baby, which, you know, people don't want to discuss because it seems like it's sexist. But. She is a Shvengali herself who will manipulate people in the 
I like the way you say that, Shvengali. <laughs> She's a Shvengali, like a. I think yeah. you mean Svengali, but <laughs> yeah, Shvengali. Yeah, I'm talking about Shven- Brooklyn right now. Sex, but- what do you handicap her likelihood of conviction at? I, I think it's probably like a 50 50. And I think so. So he, he, here's here's the thing. When she was running this company, she wanted everyone to believe she was Steve Jobs. She even did the media tour with the turtleneck. She wanted everyone to know that she was a Jobsy and micromanager who made every decision and was responsible for the success. Now that she's on trial, she wants us to believe that she wasn't calling the shots. She wasn't. The she person had ninety nine percent voting power in the company. Yeah, look, this, yes, the, the, you know, this is sort of the the Romy and Michelle's high school reunion defense, where she wants us to suddenly believe that she was sort of like you know the the sort of ingenue who didn't know anything, and um, you know, but she might get off because she kind of looks like Lisa Kudrow, you know. Um, Three rounds. This is a lot of deep pulls here. You are going deep. That is deep. The number of pulls there. Based on the pulls, I know exactly how old you are. Romy and Michelle's wedding. Lisa no, Kudrow. She's, she's, oh, she's, she's, Lord. She's going to go up there and pretend to be Lisa Kudrow or something. You well, know, like somebody who's a it, It's super offensive that she wants to get up there and say that she was this abused woman i mean for women who actually are abused for her to get up there and say she's an abused woman and she perpetrated well, this hold, 20 hold on, year hold on hold on hold on hold on I'm we don't sorry. know whether we don't know whether she was abused or not and if she was it may or may not have implicated in what she did which we don't know whether she did because again thank god for the laws in america she is presumed innocent yeah. so let's let's all just like i think i think what david where i agree with you is the following which is we do need to know that uh you know, investors, we all sign up for expressing the fiduciary responsibilities on behalf of our LPs or on behalf of our stakeholders, okay? There needs to be some equivalent standard that founders are held to. And there needs to be consequences for lying, particularly about the past. Because in the future, you say, I'm just projecting. But in the past, you're right. You have to be able to rely on what's given to you. Like, look, when we do diligence in a company, we are given everything that they have, right? We talk to their lawyers. We talk to their lawyers' lawyers in some cases. In the public markets, all of this has to be transparently published so that we can come to our own conclusion. Sometimes those conclusions are right. Sometimes they're wrong. But we can at least know that they're not lying to us. The minute that it turns out that they were fudging the numbers that they gave us, you're making you know the best decisions you can. You're assuming that it's great data. But if the data is fudged, you're fucked. And so to, to the extent that she did that, then she should be punished she because we need switched, that standard. She, this is, and, go, and this goes beyond money. She was switching people's results. She was saying that she was giving them a blood result on her incredible Veranos machine, and she was running it to the back and, and running it on an app machine. Right? Is that yes. right? Yes. And she, so she was taking investors, putting their blood into her machine, the Veranos machine, then taking them for coffee, running it to an Abbott machine and giving their results. I mean, this was the definition of a premeditated, deliberate, and multi-year fraud. Ooh. I put her at 80% likelihood of guilty, and I put the over-under at 32.5 months served. Talking, served. Um, I don't know what under, the... Take the under. taking the I'll under of 32.5 months? I'll take the under. of served. Of served. I'll take the under. What do you got, Well, I, I hope you're right, because, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little worried that uh, she's going to figure out a way to pull the rug over people's what 